Our next speaker is Mike Billington, Asia Pacific Desk of Executive Intelligence Review. Mike. Greetings. I'm honored to have been asked to close this conference. There will be another video afterwards, but this is the last presentation. And I want to address the global land bridge, which Helga uh, described quite eloquently. Uh, but we need to fill it out. And more importantly, we need to think about how this is going to be implemented. Uh, we know what has to be done here in the U.S. with the Glass-Steagall, LaRouche's four-point program. But in order to implement this globally, uh, I need to call on you to think strategically right now, meaning to look down on this situation from above, and not just at your local, uh, your local situation or your local concerns or even just our nation, uh, but you have to look down at the entire world as a, uh, a dynamic reality. And you have to look at it, in fact, from the future. You can't look at it as a snapshot of where we are today. You have to look back at today from the future with a sense that this dynamic process uh, is going to determine whether or not, as we've heard today, civilization survives or not. And I think you have to, take, you have to look at this as if you personally are going to determine the fate of civilization. Because in this crisis today, in a very real sense, you are. So we've had now 70 years of the British Cold War uh, and then the failure of the West in implementing the policy that Lyndon and Helga LaRouche proposed at the fall of the Soviet Union to build this great infrastructure development process for the entire world to bring peace to the world through that process. And through this failure, Americans, by and large, most Americans, have come to accept the idea that uh, Russia and China are somehow our natural adversaries, or even our natural enemies. Um, the, the opposite is, is the case. This couldn't be further from the truth. Um, the, uh, the U.S., since the time of the death of Franklin Roosevelt, has increasingly fallen under the complete domination of a foreign policy, the British system of free trade, free markets, of, of regime change imperial policies, as we've heard today. And yet, the American system, as it was known to our founders, to John Quincy Adams, to Abraham Lincoln, to Roosevelt, to Kennedy, the American system has lived on in China and in Russia far more than it has here or anywhere in Europe. And what I want to do is review briefly uh, the history of the United States' relations with China and Russia to show the way that the American system was the formative, uh, the formative input to those nations arising today into the great nations they are. And secondly, to show that Lyndon and Helga LaRouche personally have been directly involved in pulling out from those two countries this American system tradition so that we see uh, the kind of leadership that we have today in Russia and China. The same is true for India. Uh, I'm not going to address that today, but as has been mentioned, the new president in India, uh, President Modi, has, uh, as Lyndon has, uh, LaRouche has said, and as they themselves have said, even though she, he's from a different party from Indira Gandhi, the very good friend of, of Mr. and Mrs. LaRouche, uh, they're a different party, but he represents pulling that tradition of unity in India that Indira Gandhi represented 30 years ago, the same 30 years of our, of our, uh, before she was assassinated by the British. Now, the Russians. The, the U.S.-Russian connection was concretized by America's greatest statesman that we've heard referred to today, John Quincy Adams. He was the first uh, minister ambassador to Russia in 1809, I believe and was there during the, uh, the second British war against the Americas after the Revolution, uh, which was the War of 1812. And he assured that the Russians would be on the side of the American Republic against that British war. And then later, when the British instigated the Civil War, the third British war against the Americans, um, he, uh, not he, the... Um, that this war, this civil war, which, was, which aimed at both dividing the United States in order to destroy it and secondly to sustain the slave system, which was uh, providing the cheap cotton for the, for the British 
uh, textile industries, um, that, uh, that at that time, with that war raging, Tsar Alexander II deployed the Russian fleet right here to New York City. Many people don't remember this, but the Russian fleet was deployed to New York Harbor, it was deployed to San Francisco Harbor, and they sent a very, very clear message to the British that if they were to intervene on their confederacy, uh, that they were going to have to fight a war with Russia. And they didn't, and we won. Um, Lincoln and his economists, Henry Carey and others, who had established the greenback policy during the war to break the power of the British control over American credit. Also, at the peak of this war, in 1863, in the middle of the Civil War, launched what was at that time one of the greatest infrastructure projects on Earth and certainly the biggest in the United States, which was the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, And that, uh, that Transcontinental Railroad and the American system after the Civil War was taken to Europe by these economists, to Germany uh, and to Russia. And in the case of the Transcontinental Railroad, the idea caught on. The Russians embraced this idea and eventually, by about 1890, launched the building of this great Trans-Siberian Railroad. Let me have the... Oh, you have the slick. So you see the Transcontinental Railroad and you see uh, above Russia and the building of the Transcontinental... uh, the Trans-Siberian Railroad. so that we had, at that time already, the Atlantic and the Pacific had been connected by rail on two great continents, in Eurasia and in America, very much from the American system input of this. Um, now look at China, briefly. The revolution in China in 1911, which overthrew, the, um, which overthrew the, the dynasties, which destroyed the monarchy and brought about the Republic of China, was led by China's greatest uh, statesman, uh, Sun Yat-sen, uh, who had been educated in Hawaii, where he and his brother went from southern China to work uh, and also to be educated, and uh, where Sun Yat-sen was trained by a missionary family who came directly from this same group of economists who were Lincoln economists. His, his writings from the very beginning of his work reflected his deep knowledge of Alexander Hamilton, the difference between the credit system that Hamilton represented and the pseudo-democracy of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, his three principles of the people, which are was the bedrock of the Chinese Republic under Sun Yat-sen subsequently, the three principles which were national, um, the first was what national sovereignty, and the republican form of government, and the general welfare of the population. And you can see that these come directly from the American uh, Declaration of Independence, but in particular, as Sun Yat-sen identified, they came from Abraham Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address when he talked about uh, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So, um, the second slide. (coughs) Sun Yat-sen released his... Uh, industrial Development of China Policy in 1919. This was a major part of it. It was a big infrastructure plan centered on water, but, but specifically on rail. It's a little hard to see, but that's all rail lines. This was part of his proposal. Uh, and he said that uh, World War I was just over. He said the West had better come in and use their war machine production capacity to build China and other countries, or you're going to have another war. And, of course, they didn't build China. This was sabotaged uh, by the British. And, of course, we had another horrible, horrible war. In fact, we haven't, we're still at war as we were then. Uh, the, uh, that was sabotaged by the British. Go to the next slide. But you'll see today, this is pretty much up-to-date a picture of what China has built now, that their, their current rail capacity. And you see, it's almost the same as that picture from Sun Yat-sen. It also extends up to the north, uh, where just recently the Chinese have announced they want to work with Russia in building the tunnel under the Bering Strait. So that extension up to the north doesn't just go to the far east of Russia. It makes it possible to take a train from New York, from from Beijing to New York, a high-speed train from Beijing to New York. And it extends out to the northwest, where it connects to the Trans-Siberian Railroad, It connects directly west, uh, which just as of last year, 
that, that route is now carrying freight every day from China to Europe over the central route of the trans, uh, uh, transcontinent, the, trans, the, new, the, the, the land bridge. Uh, and then it extends south down into uh, Vietnam, which already exists. Uh, they're, they're in the process of building one that extends south through Laos into Thailand, Malaysia, and down to Singapore, which is the former uh, so-called Orient Express. And just in the last two weeks, uh, the Chinese announced an agreement with uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar to build a rail connection from Kunming through Myanmar, the old Burma Road, which is where Lyndon LaRouche was since World War II, uh, along into Bangladesh, India, and then on to the Middle East and, and Africa. So uh, look now, next slide. This is, uh, oh, you can't quite see it. Can you lower that a little bit, or is it too high? Well, you can imagine it. Uh, line A is missing up there, which is the Trans-Siberian Railroad. But this is the map that was presented uh, in 1996 in China when a conference was held in China on the land bridge, co-sponsored by China and the European Union, but largely organized by Helga LaRouche. Uh, she became known as the New Silk Road Lady during that time. And this was the concept. It's the line A is the Trans-Siberian. Line B is the one I just described to you. Well, actually, uh, it, yeah. Line B is the one that goes through Central Asia, through Kazakhstan and so forth, and into Europe. And line C that comes down through, the, um, through the Southeast Asia and then on. The next slide. And this, uh, go back one, number six. Go back to six. Oh. Okay, I'm, it, it's missing, I guess. There was a slide of the global land bridge. You've seen it before. Helga had it. The, there, there you go, yeah. This, is, uh, this, was, it, it, this was our conception from that time till today. The idea is that this has to be not just a connection from one end to the other, not just connecting population centers by rail so that you can get from one place to the other. But it was, it's a global land bridge, an intervention into the collapsing world economy, and that it's based on the principle of development corridors. Many of these rail connections go through very desolate, uh, backward, or difficult terrain. But the point here is that you make that connection and you build cities, you bring new technologies, build these, build these areas that now are very difficult, not even habitable in some cases, but you use the new technologies we have to build nuclear-powered cities, create a farmland out of land that would now is not farmable, uh, and uh, basically this idea of a development corridor. Now, this means huge amounts of power and means, in almost every case, it means emergency water policies, water and power especially, as well as transportation. Uh, and in the meetings that Helga had in Beijing, the focus was these rail developments are, are absolutely important, but you have to think strategically about totally transforming these regions, creating new cities, new states, new, new development. Um, now, move on to... Oh, I, I, I wanted to... Yeah, go on to the next slide. Uh, in, in our meetings in Beijing, where Colonel Bao was helping... Uh, the, uh, Helga had many, many meetings in, in Beijing, in Shanghai, uh, many interviews, uh, and the influence that Helga had from that 1996 conference is reflected today in the policies of Xi Jinping that Colonel Bao described, the New Silk Road, the New Maritime Silk Road. Xi Jinping is bringing these ideas forward as the leading China outreach to the rest of the world. And in, uh, in an interview that Helga had with... No, you can skip that one. Go on to uh, number five. Number five. Go to number five. Five, back. This is the one that had Helga on the, the Beijing Review. There you go. The Beijing Review is the leading um, international journal in China. It's a weekly magazine. And... Uh, after her visit there and having done an interview, they, they devoted an entire issue, the cover story, that's the cover, and a long article about Helga's discussion, about the history, about our proposals today, uh, and a link to the, um, to the videoed inter interview that they had done with her. So that this is, this, is the, this is the scope 
of what's going on in China today and the role that Lin and Helga have played in that. Okay, now go to number eight on the Bering Strait. Now look, we've discussed this today. I don't need to go through it. But what I want to emphasize is the role that we have played in bringing this idea about. This was one of the great projects that Lynn supported back in the 1980s, building a tunnel under the Bering Strait. Um, Both, as I said, as the development corridors to deal with developing the Russian Far East and Alaska, these barren areas, but also... As a, as a program that Russia and China could work together for mutual benefit as a basis for resolving this threat of war. Um, in the 1990s, when the Soviet Union fell, although the West failed to carry out these development plans, the Russians invited Lyndon LaRouche to Russia. He met with the leading scientific and economic community who became our very close friends uh, and who treasured the collaboration with Lynn. Uh, and with Helga, on planning what had to be done to bring mankind forward out of the crisis that we were facing at that time. In 1997, that's not right, Uh, in 2007, excuse me, um, Lyndon LaRouche was invited to give a keynote address in Moscow on the tunnel under the Bering Strait, which was presented, Uh, And at that time, Vladimir Putin showed his insight into the future by saying that this was a war avoidance policy for the very reason that it provides a basis of peace through development between these two great powers. So we at EIR, the Executive Intelligence Review Team in, in Leesburg, Virginia, and I encourage you, if you don't already, to get a subscription to our weekly magazine, Executive Intelligence Review. You can do that outside here. Uh, It's invaluable. Um, We are now preparing a dramatically upgraded and and, uh, um, revised version of the special report that we published after this Beijing conference in 1997 on the Global Land Bridge. Uh, We will be... um, reviewing the progress that's been made since the proposals of that time, but also the, um, the areas where it was stymied and even where the failure to develop these programs has led to retrogression to vast areas of poverty, war, hunger, and so forth. Uh, and even the, the expanded desertification uh, of the deserts because of the failure of man to actually realize this Vernatsky concept of the self-evolution of the human species through creative uh, scientific discovery. Uh, We'll present solutions for the many problems around the world. Um, uh, Hussein Askri, one of our leading Schiller Institute members, uh, has developed something called the Revolutionary Development Plan for the Near and Middle East. Uh, And we have similar programs for Africa, for the Middle East. I'm not going to go through them now. Um, But we will... Uh, put these together. Uh, we're also going to review uh, some of the projects that were on the, t- on the table at that time but then st- stopped, but which are now coming back into play. One of them that Mr. Kodagawa mentioned is the building of a uh, number nine, slide number nine, of a tunnel, or a canal rather, across the Kra Isthmus in southern Thailand, which would unite the Indian Ocean and the, and the Pacific Ocean and cut enormous amount of time and the very narrow Straits of Malacca, which are subject to sabotage by the British and piracy and other things. Uh, And Mr. Kodogawa makes the point. Uh, Mr. LaRouche, in fact, show number 10. Mr. LaRouche uh, chaired a conference in Bangkok in 1983. That's how close we were to getting this conference going, with major support from Japan and from uh, U.S. institutions, scientific institutions. Um, Mr. Kodagawa is particularly fighting to get this program going again, and our friends in Thailand are are pursuing it. Uh, But he has, this time we have support from China as well, before it was just Japan. And his view is, by getting Japan and China to work together on this clearly beneficial program for both of them, getting their their goods mostly from from the Middle East, their oil, uh, that that getting them to work together in this project is the basis to overcome these terrible tensions that are existing between Japan and China right now. Uh, We'll certainly put forth our development programs for the Middle East, which 
Uh, Helga already mentioned, just in the last days, there was a major conference in Tajikistan with two of our very good friends, Yuri Krupnov and Viktor Ivanov, the drug czar and the head of a major development uh, institute in Russia, who are planning to deal with Afghanistan the opposite way we did, which is to say, if there's going to be a solution to this crisis, it doesn't mean going in there and bombing everybody. It means bringing real economic development uh, throughout this region to replace the drug economy that now dominates that, again, under the British. So um, these are all absolutely necessary programs. But they're not going to be, they won't be successful if we don't build the Russia, China, India alliance and get the United States clearly under new leadership, American system leadership, uh, to join with this, these four great powers, which is the only combination which can break the British Empire. Break it, which it has to be done. So as quickly as I can, um, Lynn has focused on the Pacific Basin. I think you know this. From the Mississippi to the far west of China, uh, far east of Russia, India, Southeast Asia, for an obvious reason, which is that Eurasia, the Eurasian countries are still developing. They still believe in progress. Uh, when it was mentioned by, by Colonel Bao, when Asian countries get together, when the heads of state have summits, they discuss new cooperation in energy, in water, in space, in fighting drugs and, 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 and technology. Okay? What do Western nations' heads of state talk about when they get together? How can we get more money out of the population by, by cutting employment, by cutting pensions, by stealing, by looting, by killing? I mean, it's true. That's what they talk about. I mean, think of the difference here. So I would, I would simply say that I think even from this brief discussion, I think you can see that just about every uh, major positive thing going on in the world today was directly influenced by Lynn and Helga LaRouche. And the reason for that is that Lynn looks at the world from the top down in a dynamic way, as a whole, with compassion for every single human being on earth. Not what, what's in it for us, what's in it for me. Uh, this is true leadership. This is the kind of leadership which we, we must each uh, reproduce in ourselves and in our cowardly congressional leaders, uh, as well as in the population generally. Um, a last point, uh, slide number seven. That, this is the desert map that Helga showed you before. Uh, look at that massive swap there from the far west coast of Africa, all of northern Africa, all of the Middle East, all of Central Asia, some of China. That's desert. That has to be green. It's not an accident that that entire area is impoverished, that, uh, except for some rich oil sheikdoms owned by the British, totally impoverished, that it's, uh, it's area for color revolutions, uh, intervention by the Americans and the British, which have left these countries destroyed, run by drug gangs, run by terrorists. We have to take that area as the basis for total transformation, and that's exactly what we're aiming to do. Uh, against our policies, of course, we have, as we have for centuries now, we have the British Empire using their genocidal green ideology, using their control over terrorist gangs, their control over the drug trade to prevent development, to destroy mines, to poison the future, um, and all of this just to sustain a totally bankrupt financial system, as well as to cull the world's population down to a more manageable size of a billion or so from the current seven billion, which is Prince Charles and Prince Philip's dream. Uh, so we know the future and we know the enemy, and it's our task to uh, bring about the mission that we saw here today. So thanks. Thanks.